Unspoken Issues. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Unspoken Issues podcast. I, we're walking in triumphantly, ready to see what this conclusion is going to be in our third part of our coverage of Valiance Unity. So we're going to be discussing chapters 13 through 18 of Unity. Of course, the team is here. Dean Compton. Dean Compton, we're ready to close this sucker out. You ready to close this sucker out? Honestly, no. I could read this forever. You, you have, throw actually. me into a wormhole, and I could just read this forever. Like, you know, like things that happen on here. Uh, no, it's all good things have to come to an end, and this comes to, uh, I think, a really great ending. As Jim Ross would say, business is about to pick up, mm-hmm. and things are really going to rollick and roll towards an incredible climax. I started this out by telling y'all, I'm like, I think this is the best crossover of the 90s, arguably all time. Even if you don't agree with that sentiment at this point, I think we've definitely gotten to a point where you understand why I would say that. So I'm excited to see what y'all think and where y'all would rank it uh, when we're done with this. Derry, buddy, you are back for the finale of Unity. Are you are you ready? Are you prepared to see how this thing unfolds and and you know basically concludes? I, I am not ready. I, I am not. And and here's the reason why. One of the issues you mentioned, uh, excuse me, you did not mention, is the Unity yearbook. And I read that, and uh, it was terrible. So I <laughs> yeah, that. that's why I told y'all there's no reason to read this. It adds nothing. It doesn't even fill in anything. It's I, just like, it's just like here's XL Manowar, like, killing some guys. Bro, we already had that. What's happening here? What a waste <laughs> I, of time. As good as Unity is, the Unity yearbook is as big a waste of time. I agree. And that was the one that struck me as the most, because I'm like, how is this 18-part series written by Jim Shooter, of all people, able to keep the momentum over the equivalent of a year and a half even though it ships over two months and then this thing comes out at the very end and it's like oh my god why like this is worse than secret wars too i was just well it came out a couple years later no no i know i'm not saying it was like the next month it was it was like almost like an untold tales of but i was just like why like why would you like what untold tale yeah, no, it like retells half the story that we're going to talk about. We, it's all shit we've already seen. It's not like, you know, Shadow Man fought the Eternal Warrior and we didn't see it. You know, or something we didn't get. It's a waste of time. Don't read the yearbook. I don't care what any valiant people or professionals have to say. Come at me, bro. I had uh. to read it because... I saw it was a couple of years later and I knew that Shooter had been forced from the company. So I was curious if anyone else involved with this thing would would have been able to keep up the momentum because we keep saying Jim Shooter and Jim Shooter and he was the backbone of this company. It was basically his company to read the yearbook and be like, oh no, well, once you you're find out it wasn't. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it wasn't his company. But once it, once he's out the door, it's like, Creatively, oh yeah. At this point it was though, you're right. There's, it's his vision. He's putting all these Legos together. He's the one who decided what they were going to build. It's it's his company in the same way that Stan and the artists he worked with, they were the people who made Marvel the company it was. They didn't own anything. They were all yeah, employees. Well, it's really what Martin Goodman. Yeah, exactly. It's the same way. It's like, it's like, why are we talking about Valiant 20 plus years later? Well, because the guy who used to run Marvel, you know, wrote and outlined an entire universe that was his vision for a couple of years, not because Voyager Communications had seed money they were throwing around. You right. Know? Certainly not because of anything Steve Masarski did. <laughs> like, by all accounts, a big scam artist, like a huge scammer as far as comic books go. Apparently, he would tell, he repped Aerosmith. That's great. By all accounts, he did not do comic books justice. Well, let's get into the first part of this thing. This is going to be Exo Manowar number eight. So chapter 13 of Unity here. Unity, chapter 13, Exo Manowar number eight. Written by Bob Layton, penciled by Mike Leak, inked by Tom Ryder, colored by Jorge Gonzalez. Unity, day 150. Eric, Exo Manowar, is going after a conversion device that Erica is working on and runs into Rai, attempting to destroy it. He convinces Rai to follow him back to his camp and they can fight over it there. Before they commence their battle, Magnus and Gilad appear, begging Eric to come to his senses as they believe Erica is controlling him by letting him win certain battles. Eric refuses but later destroys the converter. Erica looks to meet with Eric in the guise of peace talks but tricks Eric into losing control of his XO armor. Naked and vulnerable, Erica has a Bionosaur attack him, nearly gutting and tearing him in half. 
Erica loses control of the armor and it races back to Eric, who is barely clinging to life. Surrounding him, Eric is rejuvenated enough to join the attack with his army. However, he is knocked unconscious and wakes four days later. His army destroyed and aware that he is going to be dependent upon the Exo armor as it is going to take the suit 10 years to mend his injuries. Now Eric has one goal that involves the mother god, revenge. This issue really sets off. Number one is that, you know, honestly, I love Exo Man of War. I love Eric. He's a fucking idiot. He really doesn't understand what the game that's actually being played here. And Mother God does a great job for somebody who's like sort of like the high evolutionary, or, you know, and obviously like Solar or Dr. Manhattan, somebody who's kind of beyond humanity. Really, really clever to deal with Eric uh, in regard to like his basis desires, which are basically war and women. That's what he's. That's what he's pretty much into, and he's not necessarily a bad guy. He believes in honorable combat, etc. But he likes to fight, and he likes to fuck, and she knows it. And like, and he wants to be like in charge, not just fight, but like conquest is big to him. So he thinks he's like taking over pieces of this land, and one day they'll have like a war council and decide everything. And that's not what's happening. But they can't get him to understand it. He, uh, he, at the beginning of the, uh, at the beginning of the issue where they're taking whatever the MacGuffin is, this this energy converter, and uh, Rye wants it, and Exo wants it. I love the conversations those two have. One of the things that, as far as the people who are older or the people who fight hand-to-hand in Unity, they tend to pride themselves on this cool sense of honor. And, like, Exo saves Rye. He's like, that wouldn't be an honorable death, but we could fight to the death over the MacGuffin I just took. He winds up destroying it and everything. Obviously, obviously, the panel of the fucking issue is when the Tyrannosaur, like, just bites fucking Exo in half. Oh, and what yeah. Is, it, it is going to take 10 years at you for the suit to cure him. It winds up taking less time. Don't worry, everyone. But that's the moment, you know, with, like, everything. You, you need it. Here's the thing. They separated him off. It was almost like one of those moments... Think about like G.I. Joe or Masters of the Universe in the 80s where like G.I. Joe all of a sudden Destro has the Iron Grenadiers. All of a sudden, like in Masters of the Universe, here's Hordax Horde. There's a third party. Exo is not really with anybody. The role of Magneto and the Mutants sort of played in Secret Wars as well. That, that always interests me. And you had to come up with a reason for Exo to get back with the other heroes. This was as good as any. I mean, they slaughter everyone who he was leading. And he talked, and, and, that, and earlier in the issue, he talked about how proud he is of that you know where he's like listen you, he's talking to rye he's like your people are dead my people aren't i can't just give you this thing i have responsibilities that are much beyond your vengeance and eric takes like the fact that he thinks he has a nation state in the lost land seriously like very seriously and i really appreciate that about him great issue great moments the bloodiest thing you'll see this side of the red wedding they all die except exo you also get to see a lot of very sophomoric comments about having sex so if you're into that mm-hmm. too you get a few of those <laughs> so again the exo comic is coming through with the gore for some reason i i mean i assume that this must be like a staple of exo comics from here on out it's like somebody's yeah, gonna no, get messed before up before this too okay because it's All coming right. in a can he solves problems like very violently he doesn't yeah. you know i mean he's he's not from our time he doesn't you know he doesn't have a lawyer he has a fucking space suit that shoots yeah. rays and it's alive you mentioned the conversation that Rye and Eric have. Okay, so after Eric convinces Rye to come back to the camp, and we'll have a discussion, and of course, if you really want to fight, we'll fight for that whatever. To the death. Yeah, to the death. I mean, he says yes. you're going to die. In his inner monologue at one point, he's like, I'm so honored to have him die at my hand. You know, right, he's so right. sure he's going to kill Rye. Rye is equally but, sure he will kill Exo. It'd be a fight I'd like to see. Yeah, no kidding, no kidding. So Eric is talking to him, and Eric says, revenge is a dark road, my friend. And then Rye replies, all I have left is honor and revenge. Now, at the end of this book, Eric is left with nothing except his suit and no army. And it says in the book, in his inner monologue, Eric is going, all I have left is my honor and revenge. So Eric ends up in the same mindset as Rye in this book, which I thought was a great bit of writing. Well, because, because the same thing happens to them. Right. Rye is supposed to be responsible for Japan. It fell out of the goddamn sky. Eric was supposed to be responsible for these slaves and the skimmers that he freed. And now they're all dead. And he watched them all die because he was too concerned with getting laid. 
Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed this issue, but the the number one thing I just want to focus on is the art because the art in this issue is amazing. There's the uh, the scene you mentioned about the uh, Tyrannosaur, whatever it's called, biting him in half. That's Bad a, Barney. Thank you. That's a full page scene used really well. The the design is great. Your eye uh, gets pulled in by all the flying uh, whatever the hell they are in the background. But the whole issue, like I'm flipping through it again now, there are things going on in the background of a lot of scenes. Dean keeps describing him as Conan and can, and you definitely get a lot of that imagery here, except he has, you know, sci-fi plasma weapons instead of a sword. Uh, but right. this this thing is beautiful. Like, I, I don't know if we've mentioned this before, but I, I really enjoyed this. The, the dinosaurs later on are even lit by firelight. There's a real savagery to the morning after, like once everyone realizes what happened and how bad the loss was. Even, you know, Exo's a little different from Iron Man. His, his face mask is just a, a translucent piece. So they make a point of showing the reflection and the blood and everything else. And again, I just find myself flipping through this and this thing may be 30 years old, but it holds up. Like if I saw this on the rack today, I'd be like, wow, this is, this is very well designed. This is very well drawn. So in case of anything else, I definitely want to draw attention to that because uh, spectacular art. That's one of the things about the uh, the whole the whole Unity crossover too. In 1992, obviously, art is driving a lot of sales, and Valiant often gets shit on for uh, not having great. Like, oh, that's a writer's universe. I mean, and maybe that was true, and they do have somewhat of a house style. But I think that uh, fundamentally speaking, Unity stacks up against the uh, the Image guys. I don't think it's as good, and it's certainly not as grandiose. But it stacks up. It competes respectively. Like this is not. It's not like it's some football game. You know, like the football game Georgia Oregon. They won forty nine three. The Image guys probably win, but it's probably like twenty seventeen. Mike Leake, the penciler here, just hopped onto one of the first pages that. I could uh, I came across here on Google. Mike Leake broke into comics in 1985 when he landed a job as the penciler of Robotech, the Macross saga for Comico. Comico, baby. Yeah. It says Mike sent out various samples to companies, some of which were noticed by Bob Layton, the editor editor in chief of Valiant Comics. So it looks like after this, so he did EXO, did some hardcore Psylords, Deathmate. Visitor, Dr. Mirage. The leak then moved to Lone Star Press, where he became the artist at on Pantheon, which I don't don't recognize that. I don't know if you guys do or not, but that is straight from the Robotech.fandom.com website. So yeah, I see I, I, the you know. ultimate arbiter of these things, the Robotech fandom <laughs> website. <laughs> that is correct. That's where I go to get all my valiant news. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's like, what do you want to know about Scooby Doo? I don't know. What did the Robotech people say? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, you know, I agree. Great art, underrated guy. I wonder whatever happened to him. No, I never saw Pantheon, but if I saw that in a buck box, you know it's mine. You know, it's it's funny, too, you mentioned the art because you, you're right in the fact that I'm sure, you know, no one said, hey, pick up Unity. It's got great art. It's like, hey, pick up one of the image books. It's got spectacular art. Right. But it's like music. It's like just because something wasn't popular at the time doesn't mean it's going to, you know, stand the test of time. Like, again, we're reading this thing now and we're we're finding enough to talk about that last three episodes. And I'm sure you, if no one else, could go for a fourth. That says something about it. And I think part of that, too, is the art. It's like they knew. And I think Jim Shooter's even got a record of saying this. Like they weren't competing with Image or no. what Marvel was do- interested in doing at the time. They you know, he was doing his fundamentals. He was doing what Jim Shooter does, which is I want to give you a product that you're going to like not feel bad for having purchased. And I can't say that with a lot of the image books, but I say that as someone who bought them very passionately when they shipped and I was a child. So I, I do think that's important is like, yeah, this art's very different from what was popular at the time, but it's not bad. And maybe it hasn't found its audience, but I really do think that if these things were in print and could be reprinted, I could give this to a couple of people and be like, you know, hey, trigger warning on the incest. But aside from that, this uh, is a hell of a lot better than, I don't know, Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths or whatever (laughs) Discovery Comics is putting out right now. Deathmate Blue. Uh, Mike Leake did the cover for Deathmate Blue. So when you see that next time when you're going through your uh, long boxes, which I know I'm going to pull my copies out here pretty soon. He did the cover for that. I think the key, like you said, they're not really trying to compete with Image. But they still deliver a very high quality product. I mean, I think last time I talked about like this is a Neo Geo type thing. They're just trying to get this 10, 15% of the audience. That's what they're trying to get. 
They know they're never going to sell, sell Marvel, never going to be spectacular as Image in some ways. I guess another way would probably be to say, like, you know, they kind of want to be Dr. Pepper. You know, like, here's this other brand. These are these, here's the big, here's big brands, a couple big ones. We're going to be off here to the side for a certain select group of people. Let's get, let's get our corner of the market. And once we have it, let's hold on to it fiercely and grow it slowly while knowing that we will always be niche plus, if that makes any sense. Sure. Yeah, I, I agree. And the, and the other thing, too, about Unity, since uh, you weren't buying a book called Unity, you were buying all the individual books. Take your example a step further. Like, if you buy all the issues of Unity, or you buy most of the issues of Unity because your store is carrying them. Shooter only needs you to keep buying one or two. If I had been reading this at the time, I probably would I probably would have stuck with Exo because I, I, I'm with you. I, I think the, the concept's pretty good, and it's also simple. You know, you don't have to get a lot of the jokes. It's like, oh, cool, he's beating up dinosaurs. I'm, I'm down for that. But that's that's a good way of, of doing a book as well because it's like, hey, you bought 18 comics. That's great. What are you going to buy next month? Oh, you're still going to buy two of mine? That's great. That's two more issues I sold, and you're going to give them to a friend, and, and, and that's good. But at the same time, I don't think he was thinking, oh, you bought two fewer X-Men books. No, you you like X-Men, but you're getting right. something different from me. You're getting a cool cover over there, but you're getting a story you might actually remember from me. So again, I, I think it holds up. No, at no point had, did, did, did Valiant ever describe their business plan. And sometimes Image did as some weird zero-sum game. Where like if if you if we could if you could buy an Archer of Armstrong maybe you won't buy Sleepwalker. They didn't give a shit about that. Their sales were their sales. Although like Image was totally like they really wanted you know and did in some cases. People just you know were like no no more X Men for me. I'm a young blood now. But yeah you're right. This these are books you could absolutely just give to somebody if they were in a trade. You could you know especially your especially people who sort of like superheroes but they don't like the funny. You know, like they're like, oh, Marvel's too funny for me, or these are a little, they don't challenge me intellectually enough or whatever. I think these are the ones, these are comics you would give them and be like, well, these are superheroes that could work. As far as you sticking with EXO, I would have stuck with EXO, Archer and Armstrong, and Eternal Warrior, because I, you know, because Eternal Warrior is like a Punisher guy. Mm. Um, I would have I would have definitely stuck with those three if I had just been buying Unity. Yeah, I was just going to say that that's a really good point. Is people who who complain about modern Marvel and the MCU in particular, you could give Unity to a Zack Snyder fan and they are going to find a lot to like here because there are right. a lot of people taking a lot of stuff seriously and with uh, you know very few people laughing in the background. But this thing knows that it has a story it wants to tell and doesn't have Batman shooting parademons in the head. So. But, and when there is laughter, it's riotous. And when there is laughter, it's almost always centered around Armstrong. Yeah, so, exactly. You know what I mean? So there is also enough fun things that happen where I think you could give it to a fan, somebody who liked the MCU, but somebody who complains that, like, you know, it's a little too funny. And sometimes it's a little too funny for me on occasion. You know, I get it. This is something that you, you might like. or And especially, I think this is also a good one for science fiction people who haven't quite gotten into superheroes you get a lot of different sci-fi ideas and sci-fi approaches to things jesse what about you what would you have stuck with if you had read this so i think i'm i'm actually right in your corner dean because i would have been taking the same three books eternal warrior i would have been taking exo just because of the violence and i would have been taking uh archer and armstrong because of the the humor uh, i'll tell you the book that i wouldn't let's let me be let me be at least okay. a little bit different there oh the one book whoa, that I, whoa, whoa we got a hot take coming. yeah down. buddy <laughs> Reaction, huh? Harbin, Harbinger can just go away. I, I wasn't. I, I, <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Last episode, we were talking. I was like, oh, let's talk about the drama of Harbinger because that's all it felt like. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm watching a soap <laughs> opera. Uh, I remember that a lot of hype behind Harbinger, but I just never got into it. And these two, these, I can tell you, these two issues that we get in this event wouldn't have sold me on it. So, well, I think Harbinger is a lot better if you read it from number one into these. You, into these issues you're right these probably aren't the two best issues to sell you harbinger but harbinger again speaking of that sci-fi crowd early harbinger through this and through a few more issues would really appeal to the kids who liked like gundam which is like a super like people have crushes on each other and somehow there's like a lot of maps and people are in love and they're not in love and there's big destruction but then within the destruction there's new relationships etc i think it would appeal to that kind of thing if you're not into teen drama and it would also appeal to a lot of people who like the CW shows. Right. But like, mm. if you're not into that, no, yeah. it's not going to appeal to you. It's it's 
I, I hate to use the term because it sounds shitty. It's very real world X Men. Like these are real. These are very real teenagers in a way that you know at this point in time the X Men were not, and arguably had never been, with the exception of maybe Kitty Pride and her her storylines. So that's what it is. And if you're like, oh, I don't like kids having crushes on each other, Hartman, you're not the book for you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So that's fair. That's fair. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fucking Mark because like I'd have picked up all these books afterwards if I'd had the money. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I was only going to pick a few, those have been one, those have been the three, but like, if I mean, like I, there wasn't, I don't think, I don't think there was a bad book in the bunch. Although I will agree with you. Harbinger was probably the one that would have been least inspiring. Like I said, these aren't the best to, to, these are like, it's weird that they're culminating very personal plot lines and subplots from the, individual book within the confines of the crossover but i also think that makes the crossover better because one of the things i like and i've said a million times it plays for keeps it has repercussions on every one of these books for real well you can see how harbinger's never going to be the same mm. yeah yeah well let's go ahead we'll get into shadow man number five unity chapter 14 shadow man number five story by david latham and jim shooter written by jim shooter and bob layton Pencils by David Latham and inks by Paul Atio. Jack Boniface awakens sometime after rehabbing in the reconstruction unit and begins to develop a relationship with the pterosaur pilot Elia, whom he met during the first day of Unity. As he learns more about the Lost Land, its protector Eric appears, and the plan for Unity, Jack considers trying to make a life for himself, but feels an obligation to join in the fight against the rebellion. Hopping on board a pterosaur as Shadow Man, he heads straight for the battle where he encounters Archer and Armstrong attempting to arm a bomb. After a bit of a scuffle, Archer is pulled away when Prince Albert and reinforcements arrive, firing on Shadow Man. However, with some quick thinking, Jack escapes, finding Elia at her apartment later that night. Upset that Albert tried to kill him, Shadow Man follows Albert to the speakeasy and watches him kill a woman there. Looking to pay Albert back, Albert explains he was made into this by the abuse of his mother and that she is going to end all of reality. Questioning his decision to attack Solar earlier, now Jack looks to take Albert and find the resistance for some answers. Just then, he runs into Archer and Armstrong, who believe he is now Albert's bodyguard, attacking Shadow Man and burying him under some rubble. Awakening, Jack is horrified to see that the events of Unity are now beginning. I'll start out here. Uh, yeah, Jack loves Elia. It's a nice mm. little love story that we get here where he is trying it's, it's almost like he's trying to make a life for himself here in the lost land but of course you know shadow man's a call and he sees that i think there's a point where the mask is like laying on the bed and he's looking at it and he makes a decision okay well i'm gonna go out and he finally gets to realize who the real villain is of the piece he's uh, now it, it takes him a while to get there because i mean he's obviously elia's in service of the mother god he thinks you know, he he respects her enough to be like, okay, well, she's obviously making the right decision, right? But uh, he soon learns, he runs into like Archer and Armstrong, who of course, he gets into a fight with Archer, which was pretty cool. He finally learns that what unity is going to be, how that's not really good for everybody on the outside of the Lost Land. At the end of the book, you know, he's buried. What's going to happen? How's he going to get out of this? Is he going to contribute? He was a big part of what happened in that issue where he jumped in and interrupted solar and erica's battle yeah when he did the old uh chernobyl spear <laughs> <laughs> yeah yes that's exactly what it was so you know here he is now he's buried under some rubble unity's happening is he going to be a part a big part of anything well not in this issue i can tell you that much that's kind of where we leave things uh, <laughs> not this but, issue because it's fucking over <laughs> <laughs> First off, this is one of the places where you start seeing where, like, they're laying out the future of the Valiant universe, right? Like, this is where he finds out. He's like, you're you're, you're going to put out some big hits. You're going to be a big deal. And then you're going to die in 1999 fighting evil. And it's going to be a grisly, terrible death. He's like, well, that fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. um, and actually, when, uh, when Shooter was called back to do Unity 2000, kind of that era of the acclaimed Valiant's last hurrah, he was going to have that happen, I believe. Like, because it has happened in real time, 1999, when those books were being released. Shadow Man was going to die. That was going to be one of the triggers to get, like, to somehow bridge the, uh, the Valiant heroes and the acclaimed heroes which I really would like to know more about that, but I have to say the death knell for the original Valiant Heroes has to be that they would be referred to as VH1 
out. <laughs> I love VH1, but I don't know that I would want to be an assortment of superheroes under that branding, if you will, particularly in 1999. <laughs> Shadow Man is, the, is has the inter- most interesting point of view here because he came here of like his own accord. He's not really part of any. He doesn't know. He, he doesn't know shit from apple butter about what's going on. He's just trying to do his best, trying to follow his instincts, which is the best thing he can do uh, as Shadow Man because there's a lot of things that like if he starts to think about it, he overrides what he should do because a lot of it has to do with that kind of instinctual gut feel. Feeling, you know, the, I think that he ties into the, you know, the powers of the night, go along with the flow. Plus, he's a jazz artist, as he lets us know when he fights Archer, who is who. Who honestly, I, I mean, it's fun to see them fight, but like, man, Archer whipped the shit out of this guy. Like, he just put, <laughs> like, I believe it. Like, mm-hmm. it's it's amazing how you only see Archer fight a few times, but I absolutely believe he is the best hand to hand fighter in the Valiant universe. You can't help but feel sorry for uh, Shadow Man here, obviously. Obviously, he's fallen in love with uh, with this lady who is who's a really cool character. I really like her, but he also can't help but investigate and do the right thing and feel protective of her uh, in his own way. It's amazing to see when he catches up with Albert too. When he watches Albert, you know, basically you know, kill the lady who um uh, who you know who he had just confessed all of the bad things he wanted to kill Mother God to, and he's like, hey, you fucking beat the shit. You like killing that lady, huh? I'm gonna fucking deal with you. <laughs> and that's when he starts realizing, like, hey, maybe these things aren't all as great as they should be. And also, you know, honestly, Albert reveals himself too because he takes a shot at uh at the uh, Elia. Who is like, you know, the cop, you know, who's, you know, theoretically they should be working right. together. So everything's unraveling in a way that Mother God can't help but can't see because she declared all of this underneath her notice and told Homeboy to go deal with it, which would be like, you know, telling a two year old, you know, you know, drive me to the hospital. Like, this <laughs> is not going to get done. Or if it does get done, wow, it's not going to be done in the best possible way. <laughs> I don't, I, uh, it, it, it's just fun to see all of that come together. And I think the best line though Archer and Armstrong Armstrong always just chewing scenery Archer's like when are you going to start calling me Archer and he's like when you can lift 500 pounds (laughs) (laughs) and he's just talking he's just full of nonsense like yeah it took forever for my legs to grow back you know I First half of the roar twenties. I didn't get to do the Charleston and all that. It's hilarious. But the line is just like, "When are you going to start calling me by my name? When you can lift five hundred pounds?" So, congratulations. There's really not a bad issue on the bunch unless you're Jesse and you don't like Harbinger. So, or you're Jesse and you don't like Barry Windsor Smith. Oh, Luke yeah, warm. I forgot about right. that. Right. Right. Luke warm. He's over here looking for Rip Claw. <laughs> <laughs> There's no rip claw to be found. That's right, damn it. But no, a uh, great issue, great issue in my opinion. You're rooting for those two. That's that's kind of what I get out of here for sure. You, you, you see these two together, you kind of want them to remain together. You want Shadow Man to finally figure out what's going on. It's good he had the run-in with Albert because at that point, you know, that definitely turns the tide for him. Elizabeth events bring out the best and the worst in people and that sometimes, and, and here we're seeing the best. These two people have fallen in love. They enjoy each other's company. And as the world is either ending or unending around them. Mm-hmm. Unending. What are you thinking, Derry? I, I want to go back to this fight between Shadow Man and Archer because it is it is something to behold. It's it's only a couple of panels, but Shadow Man, who is you know, he, he's not the world's greatest fighter. He's not Wolverine here, uh, and he's facing Archer, who's like a dedicated warrior monk or some nonsense. And when he beats or some him, nonsense, yeah, you, you, you know I what know, I mean. No, like, I got it. I got it. Like Archer is supposed to be a parody of people who like train their entire life to face the eternal foe, and then when he meets the eternal foe, it's like his dad figure. So, so it's right. it's one of these things where it's like, yeah, he could probably win in a straight fight, but that's not the story he's in. He's in a story where he hangs out with Armstrong. Uh, but <laughs> the way Shadow Man like overpowers him is he has this inner monologue about how he needs to fight like jazz's like jazz. <laughs> And I love it because I love this idea that how am I going to beat the world's greatest fighter? I'm just going to fight like however it occurs to me. And like, I'm sure in real life that would fail horribly. 
exactly. But here it works because in, in the context of the story, you know, Shadow Man is telling us his story. And jazz is paramount. Jazz, jazz saved his life. It guided things. Uh, you know, I, I think he was created by Steve Englehart, who would go on to create the Nightman, who was also a jazz player. Like this is this is a thing. Um, but I, I really enjoyed that. It was one of those things where I wish there were an entire uh, Shadow Man arc of him just teaching jazz based martial arts to other and people in fighting. the Valiant universe, because I think that would be great. Like yeah, it would be, too. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, it would beautiful. be a terrible martial arts school, but it'd be great to watch. Cause it'd be like, what are you, what are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm doing jazz. I'm just kind of, you know, letting things flow. And he'd be like, yeah, don't let me stop you. And then he'd go on to the next kid. <laughs> Well, you know, the thing that's neat about that fight, too, though, is that's a real life. I mean, in a real fight, like a fist fight, it might not work. But in a lot of competition, it does. Like, for instance, what usually when, you know, uh, an underdog team beats a, a much better, more athletic team in football or basketball, it's because the underdog muddies the game up. It's because they make the game as ugly as it can be, goes as slow as it can, and makes these people like, instead of going according to the, the, the normal, you know, speed or pace of a game, slow it way down they just do something that the other that doesn't play into the game plan of the other team because the other team was ready you know to just let's play straight forward well i'm not going to do that so i think that was a really neat thing but archer does figure it out you're not going to fool him for more than two panels yeah and and you're right too because it's it's a good reflection on both of the characters like archer's entire arc is learning how to unlearn all the nonsense that he was taught growing up and he's still a young person so he's still a little malleable and Shadow Man's a great example of that because you're right. Like a couple of minutes into the fight, Shadow Man's already winded, and Archer's like, "Oh, I kind of see what you're doing. I, I, I could overpower you, but that's not the point. The, the, you know, he's not trying to beat him into submission or anything. He's just trying to survive. So again, yeah. it was one of those things. Where it's it was a great like, moment for both characters. Exactly. Me. That's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And right as soon as he figures it out, that's when Armstrong grabs a hold of him and says, "We gotta get out of here." And Archer's like, "Damn it! I just, I had him. What's going on here, man?" Anyway, yeah, How it about says when he, Archer puts the fucking arrow right in the gun, where he's like, "You've given yourself away." I, he he is the best marksman in the universe, I guess so. <laughs> wow. We should just talk very quickly because plot wise, this is gonna this is kind of a big deal. But like, we none of us mentioned the fact that in the middle of this comic, Albert beats up a woman dressed as his mom, and that's gonna yeah. be kind of yeah. important later on. Like, I know we all have a blind spot to this stuff, and I, I am 100% willing to let that go, but I figured that's kind of important to the plot, so I might as want to mention that to anyone who uh, is still listening along at home. I yeah. forgot about that part, honestly. I remember the part where he kills the lady he beat up, and Shadow Man, you know, sees Season. that and everything. And It's um, rough. It's, it's, it's really, really rough, rough, because yeah. especially because... You know, I th obviously these ladies are sex workers. For whatever reason, we demonize sex worker in our society. Obviously, all assault is bad, but, I re but it really touches a nerve when you see somebody. It's consent. They're giving your body to you in, in exchange for, you know, financial compensation. And then you fucking take advantage of that because she's like, no breaky games, which, you know, I, you know, let's keep it, you know soft and everything and he just goes there like breaks her fucking ankle and like pounds her in the goddamn face like it's ufc 197 mother god versus <laughs> dirt bitch that's just i don't know that's just a sore point with me because like you know obviously nobody like i said should be assaulted but when it happens to sex workers there's this huge contingent of our society who's like well they asked for it right mm -hmm. and i'm like obviously this young lady did not ask for anything like this she certainly did not ask to be fucking killed although he gave her extra credits first what an asshole what a terrible person He's very mixed up. He's too far gone, honestly, at this point. Like, he could not be saved. And that's what that scene means to me. You know, honestly, too, uh, if you had dropped the earlier incest stuff and didn't have that, you like, and you just did this, it would get across the same message. Still it would still be creepy, evil. but you wouldn't right. have had to hit us over the head with it so much. Like, we'd have gotten it from this, that this guy is fucked up as fuck, hey, that his mom has messed with his head. And part of me feels a little bit bad for him, but at some point, he just reaps what he sows. He decides that he will make the universe as dark as he is. And I don't have a soft spot for people who go too far in that direction at some point. Now, and he goes way too far. And honestly, I also don't like him because not that I'm as creepy or as weird as him at any point. But you look at that and you're like, wow, if I don't have a couple great moments, I could have been as really bad as that guy trying to make the world feel that as broken and as hurt as I was. And you, there's a little bit of like there, but for the grace of God, go I, if that makes sense. 
you never quite relate to him, but I, no. I think I mentioned this on last episode. Like, you need his tragedy to happen for the story to work. Because Mother God is very good as a villain, and then, and Albert is her blind spot, right? So, watching his descent into madness and 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 violence and horror and all these things is terrible and it's uncomfortable but they don't shy away from it and that's because it's it's important like him doing all of this stuff and him being ruined as a person is going to succeed where all the heroes you know they're no more of a distraction i know we keep bringing up infinity gauntlet but it's like you know the in the book not in the movie the heroes are just sent in as a distraction. None, none of the Marvel superheroes you save the day yeah. against Thanos. Yeah. They absolutely do not. It's 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 all a it's all a blind, and it's kind of the same thing here. Like yeah, the Valiant heroes are marshalling their forces, but as we'll see in a couple of issues by the end of this episode, it's it's really Albert and the misery he's had to suffer through that that gives this story the climax. And I just think it's really interesting looking at these again, where it's like, God, you're, you're so awful. But without, without this arc, without her just saying, Oh yeah, well, whatever he does is okay because he's doing it. You just, the whole world ends. So it's just one of those things where it's like, Oh, this, this, this stupid 30 year old comic. I can't stop thinking about it. (laughs) (laughs) So we're going to, we're going to go get into Rye number seven. So this is our next chapter here. 15 chapter 15. Unity Chapter 15, Rye Number 7. Story by David Michelini and Jim Shooter. Jim Shooter the writer. Pencil layouts by Joe St. Pierre. Finished pencils by Peter Grau. Catherine Bullinger on the inks. And Mark Cesar, colorist. Rye continues his quest to find Erica Pierce and make her pay for what she did to his homeland and feels he has let Japan down. Continuing to fight alone, Rye also has to continually get rescued. Magnus tries to make him understand Rye needs to fight with the rest of the team. Magnus also informs Rye that he was involved in Rye's mentor's death. Rye swears vengeance against Magnus now, but only after Erica Pierce is finished, and then he plans to kill himself. The team soon discovers that Solar is still alive and can be rescued, so a plan is put in motion for an attack on Erica's complex. Once inside, they are met with robot sentries. Rai stays back, engaged with other pursuers, giving the team time to move forward. As the team finds the device that houses Solar, Rai is soon attacked by Erica Pierce. Fighting her with everything he has, even wounding her with one of his swords, Rai lunges for one final attack, but Erica unleashes unfathomable energy, incinerating him. However, his sacrifice was not in vain, as it appears Solar has been freed. In the closing panels of the book, Prince Albert picks up Rai's sword, looking to use it against the Mother God. I mean, for all intents and purposes, when you see this battle go down, he is fried to a crisp. I don't no, know if there's dead. Gonna, he, he's dead. He, he, the he next no... issue of Rye does not feature this Rye. Okay. Rye number right. zero will have a new Rye, and that Rye will have the blood of the heroes and like the geomancers have been passing down. But that Rye is dead. And also in the issues of Rye, you saw like the Exo Commando armor, which is like the red armor in the subplot that the guy was looking at that he was scared to bring on. Well, the lady with no hand in another part of the subplot, she, I forget her name, but she actually wears that armor. It's attuned to her. She was married to the Rye that gets fried in Unity. So she doesn't like the new Rye. Oh. Mm. So, like, so when I say Unity has like big effects, that Rye is not coming back. Well, it also it's the lineage of Rye, which Rye has been like a family thing for a long time this new guy is not part of that family this is all like it is all brand new the 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 title rye will never be the same and the future of the valiant universe will not be this it 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 will really not be the same the repercussions we felt for some time yeah my notes were our previous conversation about rye i was like man japan has fallen this character is going to be changed forever and then we hit this issue well, Rai has fallen and he is dead. <laughs> so it's, you know, I was like, damn. Yeah, there's definitely some repercussions for this character. What a what a moment, though. Where it's, it's a very he stood alone in Galja Brew moment oh, where he yeah. just holds off like thousands and thousands of these guys. And honestly, if he had fought Mother God fresh, he'd have killed her. Yeah, yeah. probably. Right, yeah, for sure. So she was the most scared of him, and she explains that in the issue. Yeah, he's got this energy sword, which I didn't know much about Rye, other than you know he, he looked cool and uh, he had the energy sword. Well, that obviously is a, a good weapon to have against Mother God. So much so that Albert, who was spying on, uh, spying on Fucking this fight, Brad going, Albert. Yeah, <laughs> he sees that he sees that she's either scared of it or he sees 
that it hurt her at some point and he picks it up and he's like, all right, I'm going to use this at some point. I'm going to wait for my chance and I'm going to use this against my mom and quotes there. Um, right against her with that one and she pulls it out because he almost right. kills her. And so right. she throws it away and that's when he grabs it. So when Albert finds a girl at the hospital that I, I, I assume he put her there. She's obviously unable to move. I don't know what kind of contraption they got on her head, but it looks horrible. I mean, it, I don't know if it's keeping her brain in place. I don't know. But either way, he goes in there and that's where he has the monologue talking about how much he hates his mom and then brutally kills her. And it's like, wow. OK, dude, there's no forgiving you. There's no going back. It's sim- uh, there's very little sympathy that you can have for him sure he's going through some stuff but this is just wrong and this is horribly wrong dean mentioned the death of, of rye before uh <laughs> referencing the the executioner's death from walt simonson's run on thor and i was going to bring up the same thing uh that that's one of the greatest comics ever written superhero or otherwise and yeah this definitely evokes a similar feeling of you don't expect the character to have his last stand here against the hordes uh, literally he's in this case rye is fighting just just an unlimited horde of robots and it's just he doesn't flinch he doesn't do anything he's at his peak you know, Dean and I were talking about this offline, but it's this idea of, you know, he swore to have his vengeance when his homeland was destroyed in a choice that he made. And and he really did get it because he was able here to structure things in such a way that the, the you know, the, the heroes do win and uh, everything is safe. But yeah, this, this is a great death scene because you really don't expect it to your, to your point earlier, Jesse, it was this idea of like, well, Japan's gone. So we've changed the status quo. Now we have to see what the character is like in the new status quo. And Unity's like, yeah, no, I'm going to kill the character too. And then when you come back next month, it's going to be a new setting and a new main character and we'll see if you stick around so again brave but i think it pays off really well because uh i wasn't expecting one of the main characters to die in this crossover i assumed everyone continued uh but anyone who listened to our last part is going to hear me babble on incoherently about bloodshot so you know that start that starts <laughs> to bridge the gap here you know Ra, this this version of rye is no longer really a main character we get another one he connects to bloodshot time moves on but uh, i i just wanted to, to piggyback on that because i i thought this was great uh, it, to me it feels like there's so much left on the table when rye dies and i I, that's by design, I'm sure. Yeah. But he, he had this whole interaction with Magnus. Yeah. Uh, which I don't know if that happens in this book or if it happens in the in the Magnus book. I can't remember. But there, there's definitely an interaction. Magnus says, I killed the grand one. And he's like, oh, okay. Well, when I kill Mother God, you're next. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. And then he's going to kill be. himself. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, oh, damn, that does not happen. So I was on the hook for like a Magnus versus Rye at some point. I was on the hook for like, you know, how he was going to go back and, and what was what things were going to be like when he gets back to Japan and how he's going to. He's got it. Now, the kid that they drop off at the orphanage, it, was that his kid? Yeah, that's his son. Yeah. I mean, I, I assume that that's got to be talked about. At that some is point a plot there. line that is picked okay. up in Rye, yes. Um, so. And yeah, for Valiant, like one of the things they put in their ads at uh, different times was they're like, Valiant dead is dead. Like for this incarnation of Valiant, this Rye doesn't come back. Like that's it. And, you know, yeah. we've seen lots of crossovers where people die. In fact, like we've talked about the Infinity Gauntlet a few times. A lot of people die, but you know, they all pretty much get better. Or somebody dies and they get better later. Like, this is it. This is the end of Rye, of, of this incarnation of Rye. You know, they, they really, really play for keeps in the value, in the value universe at, at this point, especially with this crossover. And that just makes it all the more appealing to me. The, other, the only other thing about this issue that I will say is, again with Albert, because... Damn, I was not expecting to see so many panels, so many pages devoted to his just his cruelty. And it is again, it's not this throwaway thing. There's a good three pages in here and and it leads off with again with him and mother God and this inappropriate relationship. And it's, it's very clearly a response to that, to to everything Dean's been saying. This is not coming out of nowhere. This is not cruel for the sake of cruel. This is someone did something and that cycle is continuing and no one is acknowledging it. And it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking because there's so many victims involved and it's just, Ah, oh, it's it's uncomfortable, but at the same time, the first time I was reading this, I was like, oh god, I, I can't I can't look away while I'm reading it. It wasn't something I could throw away. 
you can kind of say, okay, well, hey, this guy, you know, he's got problems. He starts monologuing about how much he hates his mom. All right, I kind of understand that. But he leads it off with this. Hey, Bunzi, how are you today? Sorry about the other night. I got carried away. Ha, so did you afterwards. Get it? I mean, well, that's the kind of joke you make when you really care about the about you know being sorry <laughs> for your actions and hoping Come that on. everybody's all right and the, the repercussions are at a minimal. You know, you're like, ah, oh, oh, wasn't that funny? That's the kind of things that abusers do, and he's an abuser at this point, which he doesn't think he was ever going to be. And that's also what leads me to believe that they're the same lady. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. because like he's like, oh, sorry about the other night. I put, I gave you some extra money, and that's and that's also an example right there. You'll also notice at one point like. Uh, Mother God wants Albert to hang out like, oh, let's just hang out. Just me and you. There's a thing called like the abuse victim cycle. And at one point of it, it is all of a sudden the abuser gets nice. All of a sudden it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here's some extra. I know I, I know I hit you the other day, but here's like three Twix bars. You know, it's a sickening part of this. But one of the part, and they do a really tasteful job in a lot of ways of showing how this relates without beating us over the head with it. But yeah, Albert just gets more despicable. He passes the point of no return. But I also think this is the point where you realize, think about this. The only thing that Mother God, that Erica Pierce has ever created prior to fucking Unity was this kid. The only thing she's ever really made, she raised this kid. She used her, you know, her techno wizardry on the kid to keep him young, age him as she wanted, etc. Whatever she makes is going to fucking suck, right? This is the only thing she's ever done. You can't trust her to, like, rewrite reality. Rewrite reality. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, you're gonna rewrite reality? You mean the person who's been like sexually abusing and physically abusing and neglecting their son for like a long time? The one who kept him like five for like 150 years? What the fuck? You can't right. make anything good. You've never made anything good. Why would your reality be good? Fuck off. <laughs> All right. Well, Dean, what do you think? What else you got on this issue here, man? I think it's just really cool how Rye reminds Magnus. He's like, hey, I kept my pledge. Don't forget that. Like, whatever happens here, I've done what I said. I, like I said, I think it could come across as a little Orientalism sometimes. But I do like how Rye tries to stick to his honor and tries to right. make sure that the people around him do as well. Right. Next up, Harbinger number nine. Here we go with Harbinger number nine as Unity. Jesse's is favorite. Oh, yeah. As Unity is, what kind of hijinks can these kids get into now? Let's find out. Unity, Chapter 16, Harbinger Number 9. Story by Jim Shooter and David Latham. Written by Jim Shooter. Penciled by David Latham. Inked by Gonzalo Mayo. Colored by Maurice Fontenot. Chris has her baby. And the next day, the team looks to infiltrate Erica's complex to free Solar. Sting heads to the prison holding Solar and is able to find him, bringing him out. Busting outside, they are joined by Exo Man of War and now plan to destroy the main reactor that is going to bring about Unity. Fighting their way there, Sting reaches out to Chris, but learns she has been taken captive by some robot sentries, so he leaves the battle to rescue her. Rejoining the fight, Sting finds out Solar has gone ahead to battle Erica. Meanwhile, Jeff the Geomancer finds Chris and tells her it is absolutely critical she give her baby to him immediately. Man, I'll tell you right now, that is one of the ugliest babies I've ever seen drawn. He looks like Winston <laughs> Churchill. Yeah, I really like what Armstrong said. He's like, they all do, you know. <laughs> it's a hot take. And I know y'all have children and stuff, but I really don't. I do think most babies are pretty, like, oh, bad looking for a little bit when they're first born. For the first few weeks, they look weird. They look like plucked chickens. I don't <laughs> mean that. I'm a grown man. I'm Have very busy with my life. But like Have later, they get to be cute when they're around like a month, two months old. But like the first bit, I'm like, ah, oh, that looks too weird for me. And again, <laughs> I'm not trying to disparage y'all's kids. Uh, I'm sure they looked beautiful to y'all. I have a question. And I, I actually took a screenshot of this because I wanted to make sure that I didn't forget. What is this thing that Rye is fighting like at the dead center middle of the issue? Do, 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 you, guys, do you guys see this? Like he's fighting this dinosaur robot chicken thing covered in tails d d is this introduced beforehand is this ever referenced again the gobbledygooker oh no <laughs> um wasn't there like a, a mention about how erica had taken uh like the toys of albert and made them alive in some way was that yeah. uh, or, or so 
I don't know if that's what's happening here. I don't know if this is a toy or whatever, but God, um, I hope not because you know what I would say that explained a lot about why that kid's fucked up. But actually, that would be one of the least <laughs> fucked up things about the you know that it happened to that kid. So right, I, I have no idea what in the world that is. There, yeah, that just caught me off guard because I was flipping through it and I was like, oh, I haven't seen that before. And I thought that was going to come back when we get to the end of the issue, and then we had seen him die previously, and I was like, oh man, the the Dino. Uh, Dinobot never comes back. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, the rest of the, all the other dinosaurs look normal. They just have bionic implants, usually. This is off the chain here. This is some, uh, I don't know, Turok would probably know. He yeah, knows all the, yeah, Turok He doesn't care. He just shoot it with an arrow, man. Right. What is, he's, right. a, he's not a Turok dinosaur negotiator. <laughs> you know, he's not a Turok dinosaur identifier. He hunts him. He kills him. He doesn't care. That's the Adult Swim spinoff I need in my life is Turok dinosaur negotiator. Like that, you could put that on right after Harvey Birdman, and I would watch that. I would watch it too, honestly. Especially the, uh, if it featured a guest spot by Unfrozen Caveman Lawyer. Oh, great character. Great character. The other thing I wanted to mention is just this this uh, a couple of, a couple of panels set in the I don't know what we're going to call it the unreality where where solar is is being trapped. Uh, I love this design work. Uh, this felt very Ditko esque, um, which you know high high compliment meant there. But I love the the sudden change in perspective and everything's practical, grounded. You're here. You can almost smell these people, and then it switches and suddenly you know solar's at the bottom of the panel, far away. He's covered in these. Um, the light effects that we've mentioned a couple of times uh, throughout this thing and, you know, Sting or, or whomever is going down and, and going to try to free him. And I just thought that was a really good way of saying, hey, listen, this is a very, you know, down to earth universe regardless of the fact that we keep pointing out that it takes place outside of time and that they're fighting an evil god. Uh, but, you know, there is also that that real, uh, that spectacle. And I, I thought these were very well designed pages. Uh, I liked seeing Solar, who everyone is trying to free, just just down like you know solar's a human being yeah he happens to have unlimited power but at the end of the day he's still just a person he's not uh he's not the anti-monitor he's not thanos or anything else he's just this weird old guy and they need to resurrect him they need to remind him of what he's capable of if they're gonna survive and uh i thought that was all very well done i thought again it was it was consistent with the plot at no point during unity does someone act in a way that is outside of you know what you've been shown so far everyone saves the day because of how normal they really are which i thought was great you mentioned that scene this is i think it was last show i can't remember but you you had mentioned how sting was was originally going to be gay you mentioned that right was yeah it? yeah i read that yeah. on the, the the you 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 were in the robotech fandom i was in the valiant fandom. <laughs> They mentioned that. Why, why were you over there, Derry? <laughs> God, it's only one source. Robotech, baby. The Macross Saga. Oh, man. I just spend a lot of time over there because their article on the uh, whatever whatever stupid ship the uh, Transformer Jetfire is based on, their, their article is much better than the Transformers <laughs> fandom. <so. laughs> True. Well, there's a, there's a part in here that I on my second read-through, after you'd mentioned it, I understood what was going on i didn't see that until uh, today either man. right dude so uh, sting's talking to solar and he's trying to basically you know wake this dude up uh but then he starts feeling the despair so th from what i understand this this trap that they have solar in and i think sting kind of explains it like it's designed so that you lose hope it's like a uh a reality tincture or a it's a real concept from what i understand and like quantum mechanics i couldn't replicate it but like yeah it's like a place where anything that you feel will start to overwhelm you i don't know anti-reality is probably the right word for it rather okay. than even unreality but you know they would probably both stand in we're not none of us are like you know quantum physicists what does it fucking matter <laughs> <laughs> but like, but that's basically it. Be like what the Beyonder was before he came to the Marvel Universe. Like you're basically everything there. So anything okay. you feel starts to be very overwhelming for you. If you're happy, it works. But if you start to get insecure, you'll just start to relive this shit again and again starts and again. Starts compounding on it. It starts just, compounding exactly yeah. because there's nothing else there. Sting is trying to kind of fight these feelings off because he starts to feel a, a, a little despondent and he starts thinking about this whole Torque and Chris relationship that was obviously on his mind when he went in there. So there's that panel where he says she wants Torque, not me. She loves Torque. He's dead and she still loves him more than me. And then kind of like under his breath, he says, I love him, too. Right. And I was like, 
wow, wait a second. So I, I didn't catch that in my first read. I didn't know what, I mean, really none of that stuff. As far as I know, I didn't read any of the previous issues. We've already established that going into this. I had no idea uh, the, the first issue, if he was gay or they don't make that a thing anyway, to your, uh, to your credit there, Derry, for bringing that up there. I had no idea that that was something. And there it sure enough is in Harbinger number what number nine. Anyway, I am you, amazing. I agree. You are. Well, you know what? That was not on the Robotech wiki, and I'm pissed. <laughs> <laughs> here's, what, here's what I like. I like Jesse. Harbinger is boring and stupid. Also, Jesse, did you see this subplot? <laughs> Look did at that. Did you see it? <laughs> Look at it. <laughs> I mean, the main thing I put at the end, obviously, Jeff wants uh, baby Magnus. You know, I, I figured that was going to happen. Magnus has to get into the future in some way. Right. So I, I would assume that that's got to happen at some point. But um, anyway, Dean, what are you thinking, man? All right. Well, I think the most important thing that happens in this issue, honestly, is the evolution of Sting. You almost can feel him becoming a man in this issue. And that, like, when he does the brave thing that he doesn't want to do, they're like, you may, you know, he's like, I don't know if I'll ever see, you know, Chris again. It's like, well, you're not going to fucking see her one way or another if, if reality unravels. And he's like, okay. Right. So he goes in there where it's a very, like you said, desolate place. It's, you know, emotionally overwhelming. He starts to get overwhelmed. He faces all of his fears. He brings Solar out of Solar's reverie while he's in there. And then when he comes back, you know, he goes and saves Chris because he comes back real quick and he, you know, with his mental powers, like, oh, she's in danger, goes and saves her. And they have a great chat where he's like, listen, I love you. Whatever happens, happens. I'll see you later if there's a later. But now I've got to go fight. And it's kind of like he had learned the lessons that like Magnus and the Eternal Warrior, parentheses, parentheses, close parentheses, were trying to teach him earlier that like, listen, some it's great to want to be safe, but sometimes in order to be safe, you have to fight. And for him to fight... The real fight was never really against Mother God or her legions of robots or, or dinosaurs. It was always really against himself. Because no matter what she thinks, and she's selling him an exo short, the way that he was able to go into that reality tincture and pull Solar out proves that he probably could have taken her as well in a straight up one on one fight. Yeah, he's he's arguably it proves he might be the most powerful harbinger of all time, and it proves that he is absolutely positively ready for the big leagues. And it, you know that's what I really got out of this issue more than anything. I feel like it's very much Sting's story. Also. Armstrong, man, hilarious again, drinking wine, chugging wine. Again, the line of the uh, the line of the issue is the one where he, she, he's like, yeah, you want, you know, to, to Chris is having a baby. So, like, yeah, you want some of this, uh, you want some of this wine? She's like, should I have some? He's like, no, it's fucking awful. Like, fucking just starts chugging it, you know. He, he, is, he, is, he is the delight and a half. So, you know, oh. and uh, also I really like the wisdom behind it. And he's just talking to her and he's like, yeah. I've, I've had done this a thousand times and he's telling her like all these stories and like you would think like normally you'd be like oh god why would you have this like you know this, this guy who just goes on and on who's a wino deliver the baby well he's done it a bunch and also yeah he'll have the most stories to uh fucking distract her with I'm gonna run out of stories like an hour into this motherfucker he's just gonna go on and on and on so really great moments but I do think more than anything this is Sting's story and I was really happy to see him come through he's a guy that I feel like while he has his whiny moments, unlike Albert, who is just has his whiny moments, and you bad things happen to him, you just hate. Sting has his whiny moments, and bad things happen to him, and you really hope the kid comes through. Mm. Other thing that I noticed in this trap, uh, you know, yeah, Sting's definitely powerful enough to go in here and try and pull Solar out. But I think the other thing, you know, we were just talking about, you get trapped in this thing, you're in despair, you, you just, you could probably draw some real world parallels to somebody who's very lonely by themselves and always inside their head, thinking and thinking and thinking. And what you see here, there's one panel where Sting starts to go through that as well. Yep. And then what... What jogs him out of it is he looks at Solar and sees that he's gone through it too, and it takes him realizing, well, I imagine both of them seeing each other and understanding what the other one's going through, and Sting's like, oh, shit, this is happening to me right now, and they both are able to get out of it. There's 
some kind of a message there, I'm sure, about being alone versus being on a team, you know, or, or yeah. having somebody to rely on, somebody to pull you out of there. Uh, and also, like, utter self-reliance and, and realizing other people are around you. Like, we see Sting be telepathic a lot, but this is it's one of the first times we see him be extremely empathic. Right. Solar, Man of the Atom, number 13. It is the second, the penultimate, the second to last chapter of Unity happening right here. Unity, Chapter 17, Solar, Man of the Atom, number 13. Story by Jim Shooter and Don Perlin. Written by Jim Shooter. Penciled by Don Perlin. Inks by Stan Drake. Colored by Mike Cavallero. We start this issue in the prison where Solar relives his origin and the creation of the black hole that caused this mess over and over again. That is, until Sting arrives and is able to pull him out. As the team is joined by Exo Man of War, Erica heads to the main reactor beginning the process of Unity. Once there, Albert shows up with Rai's sword, and as Erica has her back turned, he plunges it into her, giving Solar an opportunity. Solar proposes to Erica to work together to fix reality. However, drunk on power, she resists. Attacking him with all she has, Solar appears to be on the ropes until he begins to realize he is as or more powerful than her. Leveling her with energy, Solar finally knocks Erica unconscious and places her in a prison like the one he just escaped where she relives her nightmare over and over. Solar turns his attention to the Unity Reactor, which is now out of control. Really, the goal of crossovers is to get you to keep picking up one or two of them, whether it's the launch title or the titles that they came out of. The point of crossovers, I mean, you know, obviously you want to tell a good story, but financially that's what it is. If you wanted to know all of Solar's backstory so that you could just, you know, it, this was almost like, it's almost like a solar origin story that's encapsulated in this, which I, I really, uh, I really, really dig. I also like the part where, like, you know, she's getting grandiose and accusing, you know, solar of just, you know, this is all your fault because you just had this in your head, your little, you know, juvenile fantasy of being a superhero. And then he comes to the realization, he's like, well, even if that's true, well, this is, if I'm the hero, that's the villain and it's my time to shine. And again, he has the great line. She's like, you know, if anyone here is God, I am. Just such a chilling line. He manages to trap her in a uh, reality tincture, much like he was trapped in, which is horrific. I mean, I mean, she she has to relive some bad stuff again and again. Not just bad stuff, but like she mentions during the fight that like her, her dad just died, like fell and like was yeah. bleeding to death. And so she just left him. And, you know, you can't really blame her for that based on what happened to him. But like that's haunted her in its own way, which even if he deserved it, that would be traumatic. So she has to see that again and again. This is also where we see, you know, Albert finally, after all this sniveling, you know, cucking ass bullshit, <laughs> finally decides he's going to do something. And I feel so bad because he's had this adorable tiger, right? Like TJ. And like he fucking takes Rye's sword and puts it through TJ to kind of disguise it, which makes me think that the guy from Carnage at Madison Square Garden <laughs> probably stuck that thing in in like a stuffed animal. He probably put it right through that oh, thing man. so that they couldn't like find it because they're like, oh man, he's just got like a stuffed tiger, but it was a knife. He was ready to go. I'm fucking finding his picture right now. I'm changing my profile <laughs> picture. I said that last time. I'm doing it right as we speak. Continue. <laughs> Continue. I did feel really bad for TJ. He's probably, uh, oddly enough, like one of my favorite pieces of the whole thing because you know i can identify with being an abused kid who's having to you know relate their troubles to uh an imaginary friend that's represented by a physical object so that's so i got that so i felt bad for tj there but all in all it's such a good issue you really wonder how there's another part like they, like how there could be but there is but they but it really really just gets over that this is the end of mother god this is this is going to be the end of the lost land and this is the end of both the future and present of the valiant universe as we knew it and it will never ever be the same and again that's the cliche thing to say in this stuff but i think y'all are convinced like no this is just true they really meant it this time and they're really coming through with it so i love i love solar coming back on his own and believing in himself again and this is what this is what we needed at this part of the story 
you know, really for because he, if he's the guy that they've been chasing after that will turn the tide, we needed to see that almost that almost Captain America type spirit out of him, which we finally got after some self doubt. Because otherwise, why would he be worth it? You know, I mean, obviously for his power to an extent, but he became more than just a guy with power. I think he became a symbol for their resistance, and that meant that he had to find strength deep within him. That he again, he might not have found if he hadn't, you know, had that support from Sting in the uh, rally tincture and the support he got immediately afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, I think his his words uh, are, you know, I've you've conveniently presented me presented the opportunity for catharsis. That is something a lot of people go through you you do this again inside your head a lot of times you relive uh those horrible parts of uh, the day uh, you know it may not be horrible but i mean it could be something that was bad and you're like well how the hell am i going to address this when uh, you know and if it ever happens again and you learn and you grow by reliving that over and over in your head you know i i, I can't tell you how many fights i've won in my head that never actually happen <laughs> you know <laughs> and that's what's probably gone yeah. on with with solar here is he's you know he's had even though he was just trapped in there and he fell away to practically nothing because he was he was uh, dwelling on what had happened to him being able to come out of that he's learned from it uh you do something over a hundred times in your head and you're going to learn something from that you're probably going to feel a little bit more confident too in your abilities Again, it's Mother God's making. He's sell- he's telling her you're in his head. He's like, you did this to me. This is all you're doing. Anyway. You know, it's also neat to see when he comes out how, you know, he's like, hey, why don't we just, like, we, we can both change reality. Let's make reality a lot better together. But this is like wiping out everything's not the answer. And she's like, oh, now you want to negotiate. But if you recall, when he first got there, he just wanted to talk. Yep. Like, he's like, hey, you can't do this. And then, you know, of course, he winds up, she shows that she doesn't want to talk, so he fights. And then, but she, much like a lot of abusers, the mem- it's a convenient memory. Like, if, mm. it, if it benefits her, mm. that's what happened. But if it doesn't benefit her, that must not be what happened. Because here's the thing about Erica Pierce. Whether she was doing it with a giant reactor or whether she was doing it on a... On a personal level she was always trying to rewrite reality right yeah i like that because that's what abusers do Mm. there you go ahead man what are you thinking here with this the last page of this comic is the most depressing thing i have ever seen in my entire life Mm. Uh, you guys have talked about it but you gotta you gotta read it even if you just google it the art style completely changes it goes from that psychedelia to this very simplistic almost comic strip type thing and it's it's Erica, it's Mother God trapped in uh, her most abusive memory, and it's just on loop, and it is it is horrifying. <laughs> it is just one of those things where it's like, I know you were going to unmake all of reality and, and ruin the lives of everyone who could have ever lived, but this this is rough. This is, uh, you know, this is the anti-life equation from Dark Side in the Fourth World. This is like, what is the opposite of wanting to get up in the morning and keep going? It's, it's this, uh, and the switch in art styles is jarring, and it's really 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 memorable it's one of those situations where it's like you know the villain gets everything they have dished out uh and in this case it's almost arguable if it was worth it part of me is like oh man you, you should have just killed her because this is this is this is brutal yeah. uh and then the other thing which is kind of the inverse of this and you guys touched on this earlier is solar's arc is great it reminds me of um I know it's a comic, but the 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 movie always sticks out with me, which is uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the World. And at the end, the uh, the climactic battle begins with the video game voiceover saying, "Scott has earned the power of self respect, and it's the biggest power up he receives in the entire movie. It's bigger than the power of love. It's bigger than everything else." And I kept hearing that voiceover when I was reading this issue because you guys are right. Solar really comes into his own, and it's not just the question of he gets his powers back and someone points him like a gun. Like he goes into this battle thinking, "I have." to beat you i want to beat you and it's not just because i want to save everything it's because you you beat me i i I want to prove to myself that i can do this and that not that all of this was worth it but that i can do something with this uh so that there is 
you know, a purpose to, to all the misery I suffered through. So I, I thought that was great because it could have been a very easy deus ex machina. They could have just pointed him at her, but they didn't. They gave him the arc. And, uh, you know, you'll see in the next issue that I think that continues on. So I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a great climax. I, I always say in these big event stories, the ending is the most difficult thing to to come up with because you, you want it to matter. You want it to be the big closing act. And I, I think they do it very well, almost with the, the small moments more than the big ones. Let's go. All right, the finale, chapter 18 of Unity. Unity, chapter 18. Unity, number one. Story by Jim Shooter. Drawings and inks by Barry Windsor Smith. Script and inks by Bob Layton. Colored by Jorge Gonzalez. As the reactor continues to operate out of control, Solar must evacuate all of the lost land in the next 20 minutes. Finding the heroes around the complex, Solar sends them back to the places and times they had left. Jeff speaks up with Chris's baby, telling Solar to send him into the future as he is destined to become Magnus' robot fighter. Meanwhile, Shadow Man finds his love, Elia, and hops into the fountain he had came from originally, looking to swim both of them home to 1992. However, mid-swim, Solar returns Elia to her own time. As time winds down, the reactor core implodes, creating a massive black hole that Solar scrambles to reverse. Finally, it stabilizes, and Jeff and Solar head home as Solar explains that the implosion has resulted in the Lost Land never existing. In the year 3975, Baby Magnus appears in the sky and is caught by Solar and taken to be raised by the robot A1. The only notes that I had here was Jack and Elia, you know, Shadow Man and Elia. What a tragic love story that is, that they fall in love and Shadow Man's like, come on, we got to get out of here. Things are going down. Follow me. They hop into the fountain or wherever they're going into and they start swimming. And he's like, just hang right back to 1992. Just hang on to me, baby. The next panel is like, somebody is like, well, what about all the residents here from 4001? And Solar's like, oh, yeah, wait a second. Snap. And he sends all (laughs) them back. And next thing you know, Jack's looking back to Elia and she's gone. She's been she's been snapped. She's been uh, she's been put back into 4001. Daria, let's go to you first here, man. What do you think of our wrap up issue? Unity number one. It's very dense. Uh, you know, again, this is uh, this is the bookend issue. So, you know, it, it's a lot of uh, closing action. But to, to, to your point, a lot happens. Uh, my favorite scene is just Armstrong being like, do you think this door is thick enough? Because we're going to go back to flamethrowers and I don't like flamethrowers. Uh, and I could I could read that. I could read that scene all day because, again, it's, you know, Armstrong is written as this character who's been through everything. And the whole of Unity is just like, oh, great. Well, that's what I was doing last week. That's uh, that's fantastic. I hope I remember it. And then uh, it's like, well, oh, we're going to... If you want to read that scene, all you have to do is pick up Archer and Armstrong number three on sale next month from Valiant Comics. <laughs> there you go, man. You're they... welcome, Jim Shooter. Oh, my God. Yeah, if, 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 Jim, if Jim Shooter is listening to this, I just want to say hello. Good job. Thank you. What else? Um, if Jim what, what... Shooter is listening and he's been listening this deep in, I just want to say I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know. I think he would be down for it. I've read oh, enough. No, absolutely. In, I've read enough interviews with him where you know he he likes talking about this stuff. And again, I I don't think we've said anything bad. I, I think we're giving him you know most of the credit. And and uh, you know our 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 complaints are kind of like, well, you tried something new. We can't fault you for that. So um, I, I I think I think it's done a really good job. What, yeah, I don't what think he'd f- like Jesse bagging on Harbinger, but everything else mm-hmm. is not Harbinger. I, I, I say I would say. Hey, Jim, Barry Windsor Smith, really? Oh. I mean, <laughs> oh, oh. more about that guy. I <laughs> know. Uh, I, I agree. I agree with you, Derry, one hundred percent. I mean, this is. Uh, I think. Uh, I think Shooter's doing a fine job here. So go ahead, continue, man. One of the things I really, really like about the series is just the design of Erica. Because I, I think I had mentioned before, I really like that Unity's uh, arch foe was, was a, a woman, but it was also like a, a kind of a normal looking person. You know, very often in superhero comics, people are drawn to ridiculous, you know, extremes or, or, or what have you to be really. And, and every time Erica's drawn, she's this very consistent, she's this dark haired 
you know, normal woman of normal proportion. She's wearing like pants. You know, she doesn't have some weird Amazon outfit. You know, you know, it's it's but a little still um, good. Just ask Armstrong. Yeah, exactly. Like you know, the characters even even mention it. it's it's but but but, it, but it's very consistent throughout all the art styles and even at the end as as things are wrapping up, it's like oh yeah okay she's you know she's the evil dark god or whatever, but you know, she's still drawn like a normal person like the rest of them. So I, I I thought that was great that that was consistent throughout the entire thing. Uh, and it just again this this scene with Albert. Oh man, I I I hope whoever came up with this conclusion like took the next day off because you could not have had a better way to wrap up his plot yeah. and also i was not expecting it i got to that scene and i was like wait what is happening and then you watch it and it's like oh man that couldn't have ended any other way but again just a hole in the pit of my stomach he's like hey you're gonna take care of your princey prince like yes but not quite in the way that you were <laughs> hoping for oh oh man i mean yeah they're stabbing him in the back they have one lady has what looks to be like a pipe five panels of him getting his ass whipped and you're just one actually this issue was on sale for a dollar 50 because it was so small right fucking boot it up to 225 give me three more pages of albert <laughs> fucking just getting his shit kicked out of him <laughs> the fucking director's cut just oh you know, please they're like playing baseball with his head like that old et <laughs> comic <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I don't yeah, agree with you. And obviously, as I've stated many times, this was particular. This is particularly cathartic for me. There is nothing like when victims get over on their abusers, and uh, I, and yeah, he deserved he deserved a lot more than he got. My only complaint about the scene is he got to chug a little mellow vapor. He should have had to raw dog <laughs> that death. He should have been able to go in there, you know, fucked up at all. He didn't deserve it. Piece of right. trash. Yeah, that was my note, Derek. He wanted I had... to feel sorry for him. He was like, oh, my mom messed me up. My mom messed me up. Yeah, but man, but you made a lot of choices you didn't have to make. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I mean, we'll cut you some slack, but you got to try. You like anti tried. You, you know, I mean, like, you're like, you know, you tried to be the worst person you could be. You enjoyed hating your mom, and at the same time, you enjoyed the protection she brought you. You tried to have it both ways, and now you got fucking nothing. Good riddance to the worst rubbish. Obviously, he's messed up in the head because he walks into the one place that uh, absolutely uh, should not go. Right. That's <laughs> filled with people that have nothing left to lose. And he's probably done them wrong all over and over again. And yeah, just uh, trash. But yeah, Derry, you, you, that was the note that I had, buddy. That, that's exactly what I wanted to say was how Albert gets messed up. You know, overall on this series, like, well, well done. I, I, I had never read it before. It's 30 years old. Uh, I think it holds up remarkably well, especially again for jumping between eight different ongoing monthly titles you know you yeah, that, that could very easily degenerate to something like you know marvel's maximum crossover or uh, excuse me maximum security crossover or something incoherent but this stays remarkably consistent and and whether that's just because it really only had one writer or what it was still done and, and i think that's important uh, again i go back to what we said before if this were easily available as a, as a trade or collected edition even with the the rights issues with some of the characters i would definitely recommend it to people i think it's a it's a mature science fiction story and uh i i think it holds up i'm very glad we read it it's funny how like this last issue of uh unity literally wraps up like in a bundle like it literally gets bundled up solar catches magnus like oh yeah i almost forgot to catch you where you'd be thank god those geomancers reminded me takes them off to find one a and we end the whole like unity cycle has uh been uh completed i like i talked earlier about it's really great to see albert get his I also like that they weren't just like, oh, all these people, well, fuck them. You know what I mean? As as, as this thing dissolved in the unreality, Solar, you know, is his true hero. And he sends as many people home as he possibly can. He sends the tribes, of, you know, because that's the other thing that gets glossed over. Like, people have lived in the Lost Land for a long time. Mm, like, for a lot yeah. of people, they were born here. You know, right. I mean, they've made lives, their families have made lives here. From relatively low-tech indigenous cultures to, like, people who come from, like, 
4001 AD and even farther along, it wasn't fair to them for them to lose their homes. It felt really bad about that. You know, but I'm glad that, you know, Solar did his best to, to, to move everybody where they went. All of the interplay you get is terrific. You've got XO Man and Award being like, I'm going to kill everybody. I like how he thinks the Mother God died, you know, went away because he was there. He's like, yeah, hey, you back off now, Mother God. And she probably should have again. He probably could have killed her if he got the right, you know, if the battle just swung his way a little bit. But that's not what happened. But everybody gets to go back to their own time. It's weird how neatly it wraps up versus how jagged it has left the, the Valiant universe afterwards. But it wraps up very nicely, and I absolutely love this cover that really gets across the topsy-turvy interdimensional uh, superhero play that we get from this episode. Barry Windsor Smith uh, at his finest on the two covers he does here. Like, obviously, I don't necessarily expect y'all to agree with me that it's the best crossover of the 90s, but you have given it a rave review. Where has it landed in y'all's echelons? Because I'm sure it's displayed some stuff that you like more. I'll start. Uh, I mean, my goodness, there there's a lot of events out there. And one of the ones that's been mentioned many times here throughout these episodes is Infinity Gauntlet, which is, I think, one of the top tier Marvel stories that's out there. When you look at this and you think about 18 part stories, okay, Infinity Gauntlet ain't got no... 18 parts, the Infinity Saga, maybe, if you look at everything that spins out of Infinity Gauntlet. But 18 parts is a massive undertaking, and you've got to sit there and think to yourself, and this is what we say this started out in, was it Mm mid-92? Yeah, Uh, I mean, it's it's on the shelves around the same, you know, not long after the Gauntlet or contemporarily with it, so. Crisis on Infinite Earths was 85. Secret Wars was shortly before that, if I remember correctly. Around the same time. Okay, so, you know, we're not too far out of events happening for uh, comic book companies, but for somebody to go and say, oh, okay, let's do 18 parts and make a cohesive story in in a fairly new Valiant universe, also try to get over some of the new titles that were, it's an accomplishment, we'll put it that way. Now, as for where it would rank for me, I mean, reading it, some of the things that you said, Dean, is about, how all of the characters have their own, you know, their their own feel. They stick with their own stuff, and every character does something. I, if you look through this, it, it's not just like aside from like some maybe some of the members of Harbinger that really don't have a whole lot. Uh, you can't have Zephyr going out there and, and facing off with Mother God. She flew. She flies, <laughs> man. She flew around. That's cool. Right. Right. But but we knew you wouldn't like her. You don't like Harbinger. We get it. There you go. So. <laughs> You know, each one of these characters had a very important part to play in this crossover. So uh, as far as accomplished crossovers, as far as accomplished events go for a a, a, this is going to be top three for me. Easy. I'll leave it at that. I don't know if I could put it above Infinity Gauntlet. I I mean, sure, sure. Personal attachment has a lot to do with this, too. Like Infinity Gauntlet probably means more to me emotionally. Yeah. But when I get objective and just read it, I think this is better. But man, look at all the stuff that's happening here in early 92, 30 years ago, man. No wonder it generated the excitement that it did. Uh, I, I would definitely put it high up as far as, uh, you know, big complicated story goes. I think as a crossover, it doesn't work as well as some of the ones I really like, only because I wasn't reading the books going into it. So right. a lot of the subplots and stuff, not bad by any stretch of the imagination, but I wasn't emotionally invested. Like uh, Dean mentioned a lot of the characters that would continue going on in Rye. And I had to think a second, like, oh yeah, what was the deal there? And then, you know, I don't remember there was an issue before an issue after. Uh, but again, the they kept harping back on the particular theme. Nothing gets dropped. And there was a clear vision here, whether or not it was worked out at the beginning. So I, I would put it very highly on the list of note. You mentioned Crisis on Infinite Earths, which I just, I can't stand. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, it's it looks beautiful. George Perez has never drawn a bad comic. Like, I if I ever have to read it again, I, I want to read a copy with no word balloons. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's completely... It's completely incoherent. Like as a st- there's really no story. There's 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 plot. Things happen, but there's there's no story. Like and and the writer Marv Wolfman has admitted as such. So it's like I feel like it's an open secret. But this thing you can read, and it's only a couple of years later, and it's like, uh, oh no, I just read 18 issues of of a comic where I didn't read anything from the other series, and I really enjoyed it. So I I, I think that's important because it shows that you can do these massive things right if you have someone in charge, if someone's able to make the story the way they want to. And if they 
they have a story to tell. A lot of people are in charge. They don't have one. The other thing I'll compare it to is just the other crossovers that Shooter was involved with. Like, I'm a huge fan of the original Secret Wars from the 80s. It is not the world's most complicated story by any means. There's a through line there. Like, you can see that Shooter sat down and said, okay, all the Marvel characters are going to cross over. We're going to bring them to a place where things are different. You know, Battle World is very similar to the Lost Land, thematically at least. Details are a little different. But you, you can draw a line in there from the original Secret Wars through Secret Wars. Wars 2, which, you know, cross over all the individual books. So again, it's this idea of like, I need to pull characters out of their ongoing story, make sure they interact and make sure they deal with the omnipotent threat. And then you get to Unity and it's like, oh, okay, now I don't have to worry about, you know, my corporate overlords necessarily. And also I invented or co-created all of the characters. So I know where I would like to go next anyway. And as the third of a informal trilogy i think it shows a tremendous amount of growth i I really does i mean it's 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 interesting to me i I kept going back the entire time i was reading this why is this so good in the new universe was so terrible and that's the other thing that's often cited it's like jim shooter's kid right like he fixed the legion gave us feral lad he came over to marvel he made the new universe and then he left and he, he made a bunch of different comic book companies that aren't still in business but it's like when you give him the resources he needs like this this thing's good and it builds right. off what came before so I, again I, I i think from those perspectives it's it's great but yeah i, I just i lack that emotional connection so i'll always go back to things like you know even more informal crossovers i always say like new frontier is one of dc's best crossovers even though it, it didn't cross over it was a completely self-contained book it just happened to feature uh, all the characters yeah new frontiers dope yeah that's the, that's the one thing that i, I was gonna say that, that you know that it can't make up for is that like it's hard to have like i'm a, I'm, a, I'm a dork so anytime i learned about new things that was instantly emotionally attached to them like i got an i got an issue of like some mighty crusaders number two or number three from the uh archie red ribbon line of the uh was it red ribbon in the uh in the early 80s and, like, it had just a bunch of guys on it. Like, it had all the Crusaders. And it was, like, the malevolent Legion of Juggernauts. It had, like, Captain Flag and, like, Bob Victory and, like, all these guys i never heard of. But I was like, oh, I love them now. So when I would hear about, like, new stuff, I was like, oh, give me more. Give me more. Give me more. So I could get emotionally attached in a weird way to Magnus just by learning about him. That I don't think a lot of other people, you know, do necessarily. Which isn't good or bad. But that's the one way it doesn't hold up. But, it's, it, but as far as all the boxes that you want to cross over to check off i don't think it misses one and one of the most overlooked ones is that it, it, it comes from natural events in all of the book in the that how already happened in the universe like the erica erica pierce you know like if you, you read this you read the issue of the, the solar issue before the unity uh, issues of solar starts and like that's really the last like half pages like or the last two or three pages are like the start of this so i really dig that i mean i i mean i hope you guys don't think i wasted your time and I hope I didn't hype it up too much. That's the other thing I worry about. But uh, but for my money, I just don't think you can do better. I don't think you can do better as a uh, for a 1990s crossover. Well, and so. it's a shame it's not in print. Everybody should be able to read this. Right, yeah. man. 18 issues. We could. We did it. So I want everybody. We did these three shows in like a week as well. So everybody <laughs> right. I want you to know that. Like I've been telling Emily. Like I'm like I got to do a podcast. I say, did you already do a podcast? I'm like I told you uh, what the schedule was, but she's like, yeah. I just keep thinking that the podcast you did was like, <laughs> you know, the, right. the, the in one. Right. This has been our coverage of Unity, chapters 1 through 18. Valiant Comics, I hope everybody had a great time listening. Time is not absolute. It's not. (laughs) Jump on now! (laughs) Jump on now! (laughs) Wait a second. The wrong (laughs) damn universe. Sorry about All right. <laughs> Dean Compton, why don't you tell them about the Unspoken Decade? You know, I've been really active on the Unspoken Decade Twitter as of late. I really hope everybody will come over there at Unspoken Decade and uh, say hello to me. You know, we're actually having a pretty good time over there posting some neat uh, some neat covers, and I'm actually getting into the meat of a few things. I'm also retweeting stuff that uh, other, you know, other 90s stuff that I see and uh, some other stuff that I just like. But uh, have some fun over there. Make sure and give us a follow. Uh, we're on Facebook as well, the uh, Unspoken Decade. Just uh, look it up, search for us. It's easy to find. Uh, the Unspokendecade.com is where you'll find a lot of uh, blogs. Simi Fan is our primary writer. And uh, hopefully uh, by the end of the year, I'll write something else. That's, that's my goal. We'll see. I, mean, I have too much fun just, you know, 
yapping with y'all. So that's the problem. It's just you know, it's it's, it's more right. fun and easier. You so. don't have to write. You don't have to write when you can talk. That's the way yeah, I. Yeah, yeah, he has a lot. Of, yeah, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, the source material comics feed. That's where you're going to find this podcast at normally. Uh, but hey, it's it's unspoken issues. We talk '90s comics here. Other stuff that's uh, we've released in the past, not too long ago. I think this is going to be airing, I think, in the middle of October. I'll have it all edited and ready to rock and roll by the middle of October. Prior to this, you should be able to listen to our discussion on Hard Case and The Strangers. That's where you can jump on jump now. Jump on now! So check that out. Uh, we have a Spider-Man comic. So Armstrong and I just decided on this a couple days ago, prior to this episode airing, we should have a source material in the can for Spider-Man Blue. So we're going to be talking, mm. at, which I, this will be a new one for me. Uh, Armstrong knows all about it. So me and him are going to tackle that. And that should be Surprise, airing. Also. It's Unity Part 2. Oh, whoa, well, look out. Hey, check out the W2M network if you can. That's, uh, that's uh, who's supplying us with the feed here as well. I think that's it. We are going to get out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been Unity. I am Jesse Starcher. That's Dean Compton. Over there is Derry Waite. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us. Unspoken Issues is part of the UnspokenDecade.com, the home for 90s comics, blogs, and podcasts. Unspoken Issues also has a Facebook group you can join if you are interested. Just search the Unspoken Issues podcast and request to join. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com and the Rattelich and Broadcasting Network, so make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share, and we look forward to entertaining you again soon. Ah!